Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. You have made it to session five. Hopefully, this is not going to be the hill you're going to die on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'd like us to turn, please, to Galatians uh, chapter five. Galatians chapter five. I'm going to take the time just to read the first 18 verses, and we're going to ponder these verses together as we continue to think about the uh, the, the tragic impact of the flesh. Um, amongst uh, the people of God, a carnality uh, that uh, seems to be so often quite dominant. So it says in verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. That's Ephesians. That's why it really doesn't read very well. <laughs> See, it's session 5, and some of us passed our bedtime. So Galatians 5, here we go. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Mm -hmm. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us. So we've been thinking so far, we're, we're, we're dealing with the, the overall topic of sanctification. And we, we began by talking about the sanctifying effect of the gospel. That um, these Corinthians, many of them, their former lives, they were involved in all kinds of immorality. But Paul could say, such were some of you. And, and they had been changed. They had become new creatures in Christ. They'd been washed. They'd been, uh, they'd been sanctified, set apart for God. They'd been justified. But then we looked uh, this morning at uh, Paul's three men. We, we looked at the, the natural man. We talked about it in terms of revelation. Uh, he, he has no time for the, the revelation of God. It makes no sense to him. He doesn't understand it at all. And so we said that Christ is outside of his life and, and self is on the throne of the natural man. The world is viewed in how everything relates to me. And, and then we talked about the, the carnal man. And we said that he, he saw his need of a savior. He trusted Christ. Christ is in his life. But often, instead of Christ being on the throne of his life, self is on the throne. And we all can relate to that because at some point or other, we have been this man, the carnal man. Even though we're saved, we know we're saved, but self has been on the throne. And again, it comes down to revelation. We understand what God's word says, but sometimes I just don't want to obey it. Right? So it's not that I'm relating to revelation from God. I understand it, but I just 
it's too hard, Lord. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm just not willing to do that. And so, so it comes down to reverence. But here's the spiritual man. The spiritual man, well, I got self and Christ there because, because self has been crucified with Christ. He's applying the truth to his life. The word of God is, well, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Right? That's this man. This is the spiritual man. And so we, we talked about this. And we, we talked about the, the tragedy that, that in many ways, as we look at the New Testament church, Paul would write to the Corinthians. They're saints positionally, but they were very carnal believers. And there was a lot of problems as a result of that in the assembly. And certainly we're going to see here in Galatia, somebody comes in from outside, introduces some teaching, people are kind of responding to this teaching. And again, it's causing division, it's causing problems. And again, the, the root of it is carnality. And even though it's... So, so we could say this, that there's a legalistic aspect to a carnal person, right? Somebody who gets involved in, in additional legalistic thinking... That is just as carnal as somebody who's licentious, right? They're just different manifestations of the same flesh. There's a religious flesh, there's a rotten flesh, but it's still flesh. And it's abhorrent to God in both ditches. So in Galatians, we're dealing with more the religious flesh. Although, as we go on, we'll see later on in the chapter, uh, oftentimes that religious flesh is really just a kind of cover-up but a rotten flesh that's going on underneath. Sometimes people who are really legalistic, <laughs> when you really find out later on, there was a whole double life. Because you see, legalism focuses on externals. And sometimes it's easy to look the part. You're wearing the right uniform, you're carrying the right Bible, you've got the right language, but you can live a different life. And sometimes that happens, doesn't it? and it shocks us all when that happens. And so because there's this external focus. So as we look at Galatians, I want just to talk about the idea of this, that the Lord Jesus came to bring us freedom. Now, freedom from the law. We often, there's a, there's a hymn, I, I, I think we, some of us would know it, free freedom from the law or happy condition, right? Does anybody remember that? Somebody remembers it. Maybe it was a UK one, I don't know. I get confused because there's a lot of hymns I remember from the other side of the pond that you don't sing over here. But, but free from the law or happy condition. So there's a freedom from the law, from, uh, from the Mosaic law. We're not under the bondage of the Mosaic law. But there's another aspect of freedom too that I want to bring before us. And that is, we've talked about being justified. We're free from sin's penalty. But the Lord Jesus also came to set us free from sin's power. And I just want you to look at a couple of scriptures that I think are interesting, just by way of introduction. We just want to think about freedom in Christ, freedom from the law, and of course it's it demands upon us. But also, it's not just free to live as we please. The Lord has come to set us free from the power of sin. In John's Gospel, chapter 8, I want us to just break in verse 32. Um, Let's read in verse 31. It says, Then said Jesus to the, those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. So again, it comes back to this spiritual man. He's continuing in his word, right? The word of, the word of Christ dwelling in him richly. He's, he's a, the word of God is, is so impactful on this man's life that Christ is really on the throne of his life. The word of Christ dwells in him richly. And so he says, um, if you're my, if true disciples, if you're really my disciples, uh, you'll continue in my word. Then he says, and you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Right? Freedom, freedom, blessed freedom from, and again, you say, well, what is he talking about here? So they answered, this is a very fascinating section. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed... And were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Talk about delusion. Like, what were they doing in Egypt? Were they having a holiday on the beach there in Egypt? Or what was going on? 
They were slaves, right? Weren't they in bondage in Egypt? And then what did they do in Babylon for 70 years? Just, just on, a, on a kind of tour? <laughs> no, they were slaves. And what are they doing right now as Jesus writes to or speaks to them? What's their condition? They're in bondage to Rome, right? And, and yet they have the audacity to say, we're Abraham's seed. We have never been in bondage to anyone. Talk about delusional. And so the Lord says, Jesus answers them, Verily, verily, truth, truth, veritas, veritas, I say to you, whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. He said, There's a bondage that is really gripping you, and that is sin. You're a slave to sin. And it, it is. Sin, by its very nature, is enslaving. It makes slaves out of people, out of us, if we allow it to. And, and, and it certainly is a terrible thing to be a slave to sin. A slave in that you, you even if you don't want to do it, you keep getting, going back to it. That kind of slavery that draws you back. And, and so the Lord goes on and he says, um, <clears throat> he says, whoever commits sin is a servant of sin. The servant abides not in the house forever. But the son abides ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And my point is that it's clearly this freedom he's talking about is not just freedom from sin's penalty. It must be freedom from sin's power because he's just been talking about the enslaving nature of sin. He's not talking about sin's penalty. He's talking about sin's power over our lives, right? It, that ability to enslave us. And so the Lord is promising that he can give freedom. And we have to believe that, right? Can, can you believe that, that your life, well, I don't know what sins you're struggling with or what particular sin that is, what you might call your besetting sin, but do you believe the Lord can make you free? You want to be free. <laughs> Maybe that's the question we should ask. And, and, and the Lord asks that in other places, John chapter 5. Do you want to be made well? He asked that question to a man who for 38 years has been incapacitated. And he said, do you want to be made well? And it's a very sober, serious question. Because sometimes we like our sin so much. It's like an old friend. You can't imagine living without it. It's become so much part of us. So again, back in Galatians, I want to just keep this in mind. That this idea of freedom, there's a freedom, yes, from the law and its constraints, but there's also this freedom that he's promising, which is from sin's power. And we want to keep those in mind. And so in Galatians, just to kind of set the scene, um, because this false teaching has come in, this legalistic teaching has come in amongst them, so much so that they're, they're part of these legalists, what they've done is they've, they've criticized Paul himself even questioned his authority as an apostle. So in, in chapter 1 and 2, he has to basically defend his apostolic authority. And then he has to reaffirm the doctrine of justification by faith in chapters 3 and 4. And now we get to chapter 5 and 6, and he wants to defend the life of Christian freedom. And so it's, it's in this liberty, the liberty of Christ, uh, that he wants to uh, encourage them to continue to, to enjoy that and not be brought back into bondage. And it's kind of interesting because in the previous chapter, he, he's made a couple of allusions to freedom. He, he's talking, talked about the bondwoman and the free woman. He, he's talked about Jerusalem, which is above, which is free, right? And, and so what he's saying to them is, look, you don't want to go into bondage. You want to continue to enjoy freedom. You want to enjoy that freedom. Don't be dragged back into, into bondage. Freedom from the law and its curse. Do not be brought back into them. Don't put yourself under this yoke of law. And so that's, that's his essential message. And so the Christian life, he's going to describe it as a life apart from law, but also a life apart from license. A life that is lived 
under the control of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see later on in this chapter, and I'll just mention it now, that uh, just by way of, because we might not get very far this evening, but look at verse 16, we read it. Uh, Walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But verse 18, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, so on and so forth. Uh, verse 25, if you live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. And so what he's saying really is that God's answer to the flesh is the spirit-filled, spirit-led, spirit-dominated life. It was, we ourselves, in our own strength, cannot defeat the flesh, because it would just be flesh fighting flesh, right? And, and there's no way forward, we can't win. If it's just me, my determination, my self-will, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live this holy life. I can't do it in my own flesh. I need the help of the Spirit of God. That's why the Lord Jesus called him the helper, right? He, he, I need him to live and manifest the Christ life through me. So that's where this passage is leading to. It's this idea of we, we must believe in our indwelling heavenly guest and depend on him to live a life of victory over these besetting sins. And so he begins by telling us to stand fast, therefore, in that liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And so he, he talks about the, this yoke of bondage, the law as a yoke of bondage. It's kind of interesting that um, in Acts chapter 15, we go back there, when the... This question was first raised about Gentiles that were coming to Christ. This, this was a, a major issue in the early church. Like all these Gentiles are getting saved and there were certain legalistic Judaizers who were saying that, you know, unless you keep the law of Moses, you can't be saved. Unless you're circumcised, you can't be saved. And so this big discussion is is going on in Jerusalem. And I want you just to notice the language in Peter when he talks about uh, this matter. He says in verse 10, he says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Isn't that interesting? Like this yoke was a heavy yoke. The law was a heavy yoke, and he said, we could, our fathers couldn't bear it, neither can we. Why would you put it on the Gentiles? On the other hand, you think of the words of the Lord Jesus to the Jewish people in the Matthew's Gospel. And what does he say? Matthew 11, right? Warren's had us there. Let's just go there. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. The Lord says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Take my yoke upon you. It's kind of interesting, isn't it, that I, I suppose um, to put yourself under a yoke, you've got to kind of bow your head a little bit, don't you? to get under that yoke. And that was the problem with the Jews. And what Stephen said to them, he says, you're a stiff-necked people. The problem with a stiff neck is hard to bow. And they would not bow and get under the yoke. And so they, they continued to be under a yoke of bondage, but they wouldn't take Christ's yoke upon them. And, and so, uh, again, this, this, this language about this, this yoke, um, Stand fast, don't give an inch, don't um, hold your ground, it's kind of military language, do not give up your freedom that you have in Christ. And then he goes on and he says, uh, in verse 2 of Galatians chapter 5, <clears throat> it says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor 
to do the whole law, Christ has become of no effect unto you. The reason I read all these three, I want you just to think a little bit about, he, he's talking about accounting language now. And it's interesting how he uses a lot of accounting language. He'll talk about reckon, for instance. Uh, reckon yourself to be dead with Christ, right? Very, uh, you know, Romans 6, no reckon and yield. And so he's using some accounting language here. And, and, and you can imagine the accounting sheet before you. And what he's saying is, okay, if, if you give up this freedom and you exchange this freedom for the yoke of bondage of the law, how, how's that going to work for you? Well, first of all, it's going to profit you nothing. So that you're not going to get any more benefit out of it, right? Because no profit. So why would you do it if you're not going to get any profit? Profit you nothing. And then, not only that, it's going to make you a debtor. Because it says in verse 2, I testify that every man that is circumcised, you become a debtor to do the whole law. So, so on the one hand, you're not profiting anything, and now you're, in, you're incurring a huge debt to do the whole law. Like, why would you even think that way? Because it's, and, and of course, it, it, at the end of the day, Christ has become of no effect to you. Because you're not trusting in him, you're trusting in law keeping. And so he, he testifies to them. Don't, don't do this. Don't become a debtor to do the. And, th and this is part of the problem. This is part of the problem, by the way. And again, we've been kind of hitting hard at Reformed theology. But let me tell you, Reformed theology wants to keep you under the law. Mm -hmm. It really does. Mm -hmm. How do I know that? When I was first saved, the first church I ever went to embraced Reformed theology. Five-point Calvinism, amillennialism. And I can tell you, your spirituality was measured by what you did or did not do on a Sunday, which was the Christian Sabbath. Woe betide you if you dared to buy an ice cream cone on a hot Sunday afternoon. You were not spiritual. Right? That's, it was a legalistic environment. It really was. And, and again, it, 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 it had the guise of spirituality, but it put us under bondage. Like, we only get two hot days a year in England. <laughs> Let us buy our ice cream. You know, give us a break here, right? But no, you can't do that. And it was terrible. It was a terrible environment. And, and so he, he tells us that uh, he's a, you become a debtor to do the whole law. And what our Reformed friends fail to see is that they, they, they divide the law, which is an indivisible unit. Right? They, they cherry pick. It's an indivisible unit. When you, when, you, when you put yourself under law, you put yourself under the whole thing. Right? And, that, and that's what he's saying here. That you become a debtor to do the whole law. And the whole law was, mo the Ten Commandments was kind of a summary, but it's not the whole thing. Was it 613 prohibitions, something like that, in the whole Mosaic law? Like it governed every area of your life. Even how you built your house and what you put around the roof. I mean, it went to every degree, right? This is a whole thing. It's a whole package. You can't just divide it up. And, and so he talks about the law in those terms, that, that it is this uh, the requirement of doing the whole thing. And let's just look at a couple of other scriptures. Back in Galatians 3, verse 10. Again, he's told, told them this before. He's saying it to them again. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Right? Continueth not in all things that are in the book of the law to do them. Now, that's, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> If when you read through your Bible every year, which we're encouraging you to do, and you read through the Pentateuch, and you go through Leviticus, and you go through Deuteronomy, and you get all these, you're, you're signing up for the whole thing. You're going to do that. That's what you're committing to do. And if you fail to do it, you're putting yourself under a curse. Remember the two mountains, the blessing and the cursing? Blessing for obedience, cursing for disobedience. And, and, and of course, if you don't comply, cursing. That's what you're, that's what you're signing up for. Uh, James chapter 2. 
And some of us have used this in the gospel, I'm sure. Spurgeon is probably one of the first ones I ever heard talking about this, and I've actually used it in a gospel meeting. It's very interesting. James 2.10, he says, uh, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. And so what Spurgeon had this idea of a, of a, a person hanging by ten chains over hell. How many chains have to be broken for that person to fall into hell? Just one. And I've used it with a doll. I got one of my girls' dolls when they were younger, and I had paper chains and a pair of scissors. I said, you know, so I went through the Ten Commandments. Which one? You know, and you're down, right? That's it. You're sunk. You're in a lost eternity. And, and so it's a very serious thing to put yourself under that. To go back to that system at all uh, is a terrible thing. And Christ, his work has become of no effect to you. Uh, the whole point of the work of Christ was that we couldn't fulfill the law. The law was to drive us to Christ, wasn't it? To bring us, a schoolmaster to bring us to him. To show us we were lost and we needed a savior. That was the whole point of it. And so to go back to the law is a backward step. And so he says in verse 5, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Just interesting that the law was designed to prepare for the first coming of Christ, wasn't it? Galatians chapter 4, it was this schoolmaster until Christ came. Grace is now what causes us to wait in hope for the second coming of Christ. Right? And it's and it wonderful. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for the Lord from heaven. Right? That's, what, that's our hope. That's what our expectation. And through the Spirit, we wait for this hope. And it's a certain hope. It's not an iffy hope of righteousness by faith. And what that means is our, our hope is that one day, our certainty is that one day, we're going to be with Christ and we're going to be like Christ. And, and again, I, I say this often, but I really, I think one of the great appeals of the rapture is not that I want to escape the great tribulation period, although I certainly don't want to go through that. I'm not expecting to go through that. He's not, he's delivered us from the wrath to come. But one of the things that's going to be wonderful about the rapture is we're going to love the Lord with an unsinning heart. And that is a wonderful thought, isn't it? No more fluctuation between the carnal man and the spiritual man. Right? That's done. We're, we're, that's all going to be behind us. What a wonderful hope that is, right? Now, of course, it's supposed to affect us now. He that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. But uh, we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision, of, circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And again, I want to just talk about this idea of faith working by love. Because it's, it's interesting to me that, um, that um, love is seen in Scripture as the, the fulfillment of the law. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's love that fulfills the law. And, and so he, he's emphasizing this, that this, this is the way of victory. Uh, it's love. And, and how do we get love? Where does that love come from? Right? If love is the fulfillment of the law, where does that love come from? The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who was given to us. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Galatians chapter 5. We haven't got there yet, but we're going to get there. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, right? And, and so, so the solution is faith which works by love. And so what's that faith in? Faith that works by love, that expresses itself in love, but, but it's, it's faith on the, the indwelling Holy Spirit to produce that love that will cause obedience to the law. Right? It goes back to Him. It goes back to a dependence on the indwelling Holy Spirit. Faith expressing itself through 
love. And there's a great emphasis on love in this chapter. So we saw in verse 6, faith which works by love. Verse 13, brethren, you've been called to liberty, use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Verse 14, all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And so it's love. And so let's just, I remember Jabe saying this. Uh, he said, you know, he's never ever felt tempted to slash the tires of his grandmother's car. Why? He loves his grandma. Why would he do anything like that, you see? Because love is a motivation, right? I don't want to do anything to hurt that person. I love that person. And so if our hearts were filled with love, even for the brethren, right? If, if we love one another with a pure heart fervently, we wouldn't be biting and devouring one another, would we? Mm-hmm. Right? So, so love is the key. But how do I get that love? It's not natural to me. I'm sorry, but it isn't. Right? What's natural to all of us is self-life. Right? So that love has to come from somewhere. And it's the love that is produced by the Spirit of God that enables us to love one another with a pure heart for a moment. We can't do it without His enabling and His empowerment. It's impossible. You know what? It's interesting. First Corinthians 13 says this. I love this. Love never fails. Isn't that encouraging to know? It never fails. And so maybe, let's just an aside here, maybe we need to be praying, Lord, would you fill me with the love that the Holy Spirit wants to produce in my life? I, I want to be filled with love. Help me to love the people of God. Help me to love a lost world. Help me to be a person that's just oozing with love. Do something in this heart and fill it with your love. I think that would have a big difference in our assembly life. Go to, the, go to the meetings, praying, Lord, can, would you show your love for God's people through me? I just want to be a conduit. Show me how I can love them today. Mm-hmm. Would that make a difference about your Sunday morning meeting if you went there with that desire? Mm-hmm. Right? That's what it really comes to. And so love is, is the fulfillment of the law. It, it never fails. Law always fails. Love never fails. Law always fails. And so we need this love. And so he says, again, verse 7, he says, You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Now, Paul often uses the analogy of a race to describe the Christian life. We're, We're running a race. And it's not a sprint. Some of us are learning that it's a marathon. We've been on this race a long time but here's the picture they were running well okay they're they're making good progress the galatians praise the lord it was wonderful they're running well and then he says who has and the language is is literally this idea that somebody's cut in in front of you and caused you to stumble who's done this and, and, and so clearly it's, it's a, an influence that's come into the assembly from outside. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Who's cut in on you? I, I remember one time I was in uh, Mumbai Airport in India. I'm in a rush to catch the next flight. And this was before the days I had enough sense. I didn't have enough sense to get a backpack. And I had one of these, these kind of bags that you drag behind you. Yeah, it's like dragging a, a corpse around with all my notes in this thing. And so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of on a mission to get to the next flight. And just as a, a guy with another one of these dead corpses put in right in front of me, and I went straight on my knees on a tile floor in the airport in India, and I was just in agony. I finally made the plane just hobbling <laughs> to the destiny. But somebody cut in. And that's the picture here. You were running well. Who was it that cut in, that caused you to, 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 to lose your momentum in this race? And so somebody, it's, it's somebody here, somebody has done this, who's caused them to break stride, to stumble. Uh, somebody, uh, and again, though um, many false teachers 
were um, disturbing the Galatians, the singular pronoun who indicates that the leader of the Judaizers is in view here. Okay, who? And then he goes on and he says, um, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You see, they're being deceived. Because Satan's a deceiver. And, and we, we talked a little bit about his workings. One of the things he wants to do is he wants to rob the church of its liberty and freedom in Christ. He wants to rob us of the, the spirit-filled life and of the, the abundant, loving life that we're supposed to have and, and to get us sidetracked into legalism. He wants to do that. And so, and he uses individuals. And here's this, in, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion comes not of him that calleth you. In other words, this is not from God. This, is, this teaching is not from God. That's come in and so disturbed the assembly. And then he says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It's interesting, isn't it? That, that picture of leaven in scripture. And, and invariably, leaven speaks of, of evil in its permeating character, how it spreads. It just, it doesn't stay. It, it, my, my mother used to bake wonderful bread. And she used to use real yeast, and she'd put it in the mix, and, and it would just, it would go through the whole batch, and it would just rise up, and it was delicious. It didn't last long as soon as it was out of the oven, it was gone, but it was, it was amazing. But I've seen the process, I, I get the picture here. And, and sadly, um, it only takes one individual to come in, and I talked about my first church I was ever involved in, a 21-year-old university student got the ears of the oversight. And we went from being a mission church, very aggressively evangelistic, to embracing this whole reform thing, and the whole atmosphere changed. One person. Amazing. I've, I've seen it with my own eyes. By the way, that's why we must exercise care in reception in the local assembly. Amen. Right? Now, we're not trying to keep God's people away from remembering their Savior. Right? We, we want to have a biblical view of reception, but we do not, we, we have to exercise care. We've got to talk to people. Uh, and, and you get people coming. I had somebody come to our assembly. I happened to be on the door. And I'm not an elder or anything, but I know the mind of the elders pretty well. I know them really well. This guy came to me, and his first words were, I'm a five-point Calvinist and a millennialist. He didn't even say hello. That was his first <laughs> word. And so I shook his hand, and I, 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 said, uh, I said, I'm Mike. Why are you here? I mean, I'm not being awkward, but like, why are you here? I said, we don't believe any of that stuff. You'll never get the pulpit in this assembly believing that stuff. Why would you come here? And I took him out for lunch. I, was being nice. I wasn't being nasty. But we have to recognize a person like that cannot keep his passionate view of his false theology to himself. You've got to guard the flock. And, and sometimes because we're small assemblies, we're so desperate to have warm bums on the seats that we'll receive anybody because we want people. But you could have a person come in and you lose even the ones you've got. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And we have to exercise caution. False teaching spreads and permeates. And it affects lives. And so we have to tell people, look, this is what we believe. This is what we stand for. And we're not up for discussion. These are things that we believe the Lord has called us to meet together, to testify for. We're not going to compromise. This is what we stand on. But notice verse 10. I like this. I love, I love this about Paul. He says, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubled you shall bear his judgment, whoever he be. So, so Paul still had a, a confidence in them. I like that. Look at Hebrews 6. I want you just to see this other passage that kind of parallels. And, and again, I, I just like Paul's attitude. He, his confidence ultimately is in that the, the people of God are going to do the right thing. Hebrews 6 verse 9, he says, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. 
and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. And so he did have confidence in them, that they'll return to their right mind, and that the false teacher, whoever he is, or well, however important he may have seemed to be, will suffer God's judgment. And then he goes on and he says, I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. So Paul is saying, like, he's still being persecuted by the Judaizers. And if you read the book of Acts, you'll see this, that, that these people dogged him everywhere he went. I mean, they literally went from town to town. Uh, trying to shut down his message of grace, didn't they? And he said, if, if, I, if, this, if I was preaching this stuff, I wouldn't have any of this hassle. I'd be accepted amongst the, the Judaizing camp. But, but he still was suffering persecution from them. <laughs> and he talks about the cross's offense. And really, the, the cross is offensive to the legalistic mind. Very offensive. Because the cross is saying to man, and man's religious flesh, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. Nothing you can do to earn salvation. Nothing you can do to add to salvation. And so, so th there's a certain sense that there's an offense of the cross. The cross is very... Is it, was that you or was that me? <laughs> the cross is very offensive to a religious mind, isn't it? It, it? They say it's too easy. It's too simple. We've got to do something. So, so it's really an offense, and Paul talks about that. And um, again, interesting too, that back in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 29, um, Oh, I'm thinking Genesis 4, 29. Cain and Abel, sorry. That's the story of Cain and Abel. Remember Genesis, we talked a little bit about that, didn't we, in Mercer's session. That the man that comes to God by simple trust in a substitute on his behalf will always be persecuted by the person who is coming to God on the basis of his own effort. Always. It always operates on that basis. And so... Going back to Cain, uh, it's, that's been the principle. And so Paul talks about this, the, the offense, the scandal of the cross. So let's just think a little bit in the few minutes we have left here. I want to think a little bit about legalism as we would see it today. Because legalism is the imposition of unbiblical or out-of-context requirements on the saints, often by powerful personalities. So again, who is this that's done this, that's troubling you? It's some powerful personality and is imposing unbiblical or out-of-context requirements on the saints from powerful personalities. As a mark of either spirituality or holiness or a requirement. I can remember, and I don't know what you think of the Bill Gothard things, I'm not making a whole judgment, but I remember reading some stuff on circumcision. Anybody even know who I'm talking about, Bill Gothard? Yeah, okay, yeah, some of you do. This was big in the 80s, huge in the 80s, actually. It really was. They had these big things and conferences and uh, of seminars, basic seminars and stuff. But I remember reading one, and it was on circumcision. And his whole basis of the idea that every Christian should be circumcised was based on Paul circumcising Timothy. Now, whatever you think of circumcision, if you're doing it for health benefits, that's fine. I don't have an issue with that. But it, he didn't just talk about health benefits. This was a whole spiritual thing. This really was. And I just thought, here's a powerful personality, and he's influencing multitudes of people into, I think, a legalistic lifestyle. Now, did he say some good things? Yeah, he did. There's always a mixture, you see. That's the, that's the danger with error. It's always a mixture. Like the leaven is just a little bit in a whole batch, right? It, it's all, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you could have water that's 99.9% .9 pure and the other bit's arsenic. Won't do you much good, right? 
And so, again, this is poisonous. And so, so what does it look like today, this legalism idea? And often it's a misused word today, by the way, an abused word, because, because it's used to people that want to just simply follow in obedience the simple truth of Scripture. But, on the other hand, there are genuine legalists. So I remember, that I, from my own experience, I remember being in a, a, an assembly, and a brother rebuked me because I had brown shoes on, and he said, you should be wearing black. Hmm. Hmm. Now, I asked him, I said, can you show me in Scripture that black shoes are more spiritual than brown shoes, and if you can show me, I'll go get a pair. Now, I'm not trying to be a, a rambunctious, but that's legalism, right? White shirts are more spiritual than blue shirts, right? You, you, you've seen this kind of stuff. Who makes these things up? I don't know who they are. <laughs> but somebody at some point decided this is more spiritual. And it's imposing it on the saints, and usually by powerful personalities. Maybe excellent speakers or whatever. But they're bringing saints into bondage. So you, you have to, I know if I go to the meeting, I've got to wear this outfit to be accepted. Ties is an interesting thing. I'm getting into trouble here. I know that. But I have a friend down in the Bahamas. Uh, he comes to the assembly there, Spanish Wells, and he's, he's from a Mennonite background. And you know that the Mennonites, back in the 1930s, said that ties were worldly and should never be worn. There's a group that still says it right. today. And he, you never see him wearing a tie because it's, it's, it's kind of a... It's a it's an outward show of this kind of ostentatious display, and yet some places you can't preach unless you're wearing a tie, right? So who's right? Are the Mennonites right, or are the tie wearers right? I think the Mennonites. <laughs> 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 external standards don't make a man so you could wear brown shoes and no tie and have a message from God and be a very spiritually minded brother and you can have the right outfit and be a very fleshly man Right? So we got we just got to watch this kind of stuff. Yeah, and so <clears throat> Paul, he, he doesn't um, mince words here. He says, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. You know what he's saying? He wants them to castrate themselves. <laughs> That's pretty strong, isn't it? He wished the Judaizers who were so enthusiastic about circumcision would go the whole way and castrate themselves. Perhaps the resulting physical impotence pictured would cut off their power. Paul, his desire was that they were unable to reproduce. You see, that's what castration does, right? It makes it impossible to reproduce. He doesn't want them reproducing. That's the picture. Now you say, boy, that's, is that loving? He's just talked about, you know, faith which works by love. But listen, if, if you love God's people, you will learn to hate false doctrine. And I don't think we take false doctrine seriously enough. Because of the damage it does to the people of God. Because of the bondage that it puts them under. And so he, 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 t he takes this very strong la line here against them. And again, part of it, there's a, some of the pagan priests that would have been in Corinth, uh, oftentimes they would be castrated in the worship of pagan deities. And so he's, he's kind of saying, uh, it, what he's saying to them is startling. It really is. Because somebody who was castrated, Deuteronomy 23, verse 1, what happens? They weren't able, able to enter into the presence of the Lord, were they? 
And so, so there's a strong, strong language here. And I just want to say this, I, I, I believe our time has gone in this session, but I want to just say this. If we were as concerned for God's church and God's word as Paul was, was we too would wish that false teachers might cease from the land. We would. We want it to end because of what it does. And so this is this is pretty serious stuff. Now we'll pick it up again tomorrow. But I just I, I hope we can see this that <clears throat> the enemy, as we've heard, is always trying to thwart what God wants to do. And his his methodology is insidious. Somebody coming in from outside. Somebody working in a sinister way, beginning to push these false ideas, and they begin to affect the whole company of believers. And so these, uh, these Galatians who were running well, that's the tragedy, they were running well. And now this one individual is coming and he's cut in in front of them and they're stumbling. And they're not making progress anymore. In fact, they're going backwards. They're going back to a legalistic system that can't help them at all. And in going back, they're going away from Christ and the simplicity that is found in Christ. Who has corrupted you from the simplicity that's in Christ? So these are very serious things and things that affect our assemblies in a very definite way. And oh, how we need to pray that God would raise up wise, godly shepherds who could protect the flock. We need that today. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this uh, short time we've had in your word, and we pray, Lord, it's been a great day, uh, at least from my perspective, so enjoyed listening uh, to the word of God ministered by my brothers. Uh, Lord, continue to help us, Lord. We, these are serious matters. We want to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we, we want to walk in love. Uh, we want to love the brethren with a pure heart fervently. And we don't want to be caught up with bondage anymore. Help us in these things, we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. amen.